Okay, hello everyone. This is the review for the midterm exam. And we're going to focus not on the actual answers to the practice exam. I actually have, I think it's a two hour um, review session from a previous term that I'll post to the course website. And I recommend that you watch that after you've taken the practice exam. Because part of what we want to do is to give you an idea of what the exam is like. And then once you take the exam, you kind of get a sense of the, the what I would say is the arc of the exam. You know how long it'll take, you know what, what your strengths or weaknesses are. It's really pedagogical. It's so that we're not here to surprise you. There should be no surprises. There are no gotcha questions. Um, testing is kind of an, a necessary evil, I would say. If I could have, create, um, um, my, and my vision of the of education would be one in which we don't test people and then rank them. It would be one in which we encourage people to maintain their curiosity and their enthusiasm despite the fact that we, yes, of course, we have to test you, um, especially if you are looking for credentials. But in my view, that's, that's, not what motiv that's not what motivates me to do statistics. It's not what motivates me to teach you. And it's not what I want to be a major factor for you. We want everyone to do well. There's no curve. There's nothing like that. It's, in my view, it's something like literacy. There's no exam out there that says, um, okay, we, don't want, we want some people to be more literate than others. No, there's actually a societal push in the United States or about 100 years ago that we recognize the importance of having a well-educated populace. Um, and crucial to that is having a populace that is literate, that can read. I think of the same way about statistics. It's a kind of numerical um, quantitative literacy in a way, which means, okay, if everyone gets an A plus on this, perfect, good. Go out there and, and, and um, do good. Okay, so that's, that's important to point out. Um, and what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk to you about the, the structure of the, the, um, the exam how to take it, and just some tips and advice. And after that, we're gonna go um, to some, some of the core material and how to prep for the exam. And I'm gonna focus on the, the issues that are probably give us the most hangups, I'd say. Okay, so I'm actually gonna sh show the, exam the, um, the practice exam, but I'll try to show it to you without answers because I just want, I want to use that as the template for you. Um, so when we talk about exams and tests, keep in mind um, that this is not gonna cover the last week. It's not gonna talk about um, anything having to do with sampling distributions. So the main theme of the first part of the course, this midterm exam, is descriptive statistics. It is not, it, we will have the probability stuff, but it has nothing to do with inferential statistics. Inferential statistics is using the data that you have at hand to make claims about a population. You're inferring from what you have to something larger. That's the second half. This half of the course, it's not that at all. It, and it's not that last week. Okay. So, um, if I can get to the, um, the notes, sorry. Okay, so the, the one that I have actually has the answers here. 
um, to my chagrin. Let's see if I can find one that doesn't have have it. Um, Let's see if I can use this one. Okay, what I'll do is I'll actually show you the practice final exam. Um, it'll have some of the answers there. The practice final exam will include question and content that you're not familiar with. The reason I'm doing it is so that way you don't inadvertently look at answers that uh, would influence your, um, I guess, the way, the, the way you're thinking about the, um, the exam. The, what I'm going to focus on are the kinds of questions that we ask. So, well, here, I'm sorry. I need to share the screen. So for both the, um, the, the final exam and for the midterm exam, you will have 120 minutes to complete it. Um, that's two hours. Let me share the screen so you'll be able to see what this looks like. I'm only going to show you, again, the practice final exam with answers. I'm not going to talk about any particular content here. I'm talking about the flow of the exam, how to manage your time so you don't run out of time, and how to sort of think about the, the, the categories of questions that, that, that are being addressed. Okay. So I'm going to share the screen and I'll share on uh, the practice exam. So you should be able to see this here. This is actually um, a PDF version of <clears throat> what you take when you um, will take it online. So obviously the first thing you want to make sure is that you have a, a, a solid internet connection and that it won't you know, fail on you. If that happens, please contact us. And I would not spend any time reading this, but this is essentially the structure of the exam. I'm going to um, go through it pretty quickly. There are about 30 to 35 questions here, and it's worth 100 points. And those points for each question are going to vary. Some are worth one or two points. Some are worth more. Typically, the questions that might have a right and answer or that we see as more difficult are going to be worth more points. But take a look at that, because if, if, you're, if you're not sure about something, um, you, know, you may want to focus more on the higher point questions. But I would use the practice exam as a template for rehearsing, as a dress rehearsal for the, for the uh, midterm. I would not spend any time reading this, because you should already know what's going to happen. Um, in fact, I think I can show you the practice exam. No, it's, it's kind of covered up, but it's the same structure. So I'll, I'll just read this and I'll describe it. But do not waste your 120 minutes reading the instructions for the exam. I've known students who have done that. Do not do that. Okay, so you have two hours. And what this means is that once you start the exam, it's sort of like a video rental. Um, once you start the exam, you have a two-hour window upon which you can complete it. And after that, it expires. So if you don't answer and if you don't have it, sorry, if you leave any questions blank, you will get those wrong. So ideally, use the practice exam to time your exam. I put a timer in and see how long it takes. I would also, when you're taking the exam, Keep some timer or reminder, so that way you don't hyper-focus on one part of the exam or the other. Just, just so you have kind of a running tally of, of how much time there is. Okay, so once you start the clock, it's two hours. That's longer than we've tested it to take, but it still might be longer than for some of you. So while we do not consider this to be a race against the clock, 
we do recognize that some students, which is fine, may run out of time or may want to take longer. But I do not want any student to fail to answer a question because they ran out of time. So if you find yourself um, running out of time in the practice exam in particular, make sure you have some timer handy. I'll show you what I have. This is a little noisy, but I'm, I'm a little old school here. I don't like to necessarily have this on my computer. You can do that. You can use an iPhone. But maybe you want to put in 20 minutes, and it'll tick, which is kind of frightening. But it'll ding. You know, a little egg timer would work. And I put in 20 minutes because you can kind of chunk it. You can sort of, you know, adapt your strategy according to the time. We don't have a test proctor, but I think that's, that's really important. Because then if you find out you have 10 minutes left, heaven forbid, I don't think you would. Then if you have 10 minutes left or five minutes left and you have lots of questions, at the very least, guess. There's no penalty in guessing. So please do that. I've seen some students who just seem to have given up and I don't want that to happen. Okay. Now, the exam is, quote, open book, in that you can use any textbook, notes, problem sets, lectures, blah, 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 to help you answer the questions. Now, this is how I would do it. I would keep on, on file all of the lectures um, to the desktop, and, as well as the, the course books, and any notes. What I would do is I would also make use of control F. You might want to use a control F to find certain phrases, certain references. Now, the challenge is, even though it's open book, you may spend more time thumbing through or searching for the material than you would like. So, while it's useful to have everything open book, I would strongly recommend that you create some kind of cheat sheet. It can be digital, you know, you can, you can cut and paste things, or you can write it out. And I would focus mostly on including some of the equations or whatever you find most challenging. Um, and we'll focus on that later, but I, I, my advice would be to focus on some of the equations and some of the rules. In particular, focus on the, um, the various multiplication and addition rules in um, on, on, on probability. I think that's, that's, a, that's something that is kind of tricky for a lot of students. But equations are, are necessary because you, you, that's sort of foundational. We're not testing you to memorize the equation, but we might ask you to do some simple algebra, like solve, let's say we give you a correlation and then we give you a, you know, the, the covariance of, of X and Y and we want to ask you, I don't know, to solve for 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 the remainder. Um, I would not include the problem set code unless you find it helpful. For me, I find that to be helpful um, because I do a lot of math and stuff within R. So if, if you're that kind of person, open up R and, and use that. Um, but it's not necessary. But what you should do is you should also um, review the, make sure you can interpret the R output. Okay, so as I said, where's everything here? If you find outside material as well, go ahead and, and use that. Um, the world's your oyster, I mean, in, in, the, in that sense. Um, now, let's get to the, the to the structure. So basically, when I talk about kind of preparing for the exam, this first section is keep mind, be mindful of the time. Um, have available the, all the resources just in case you want to do something. I prefer digital copies of, of the lectures and the books because you can do a control F search. But do whatever works. Um, maybe include some bookmarks. Whatever it is, you, you don't want to spend time, you know, thumbing through the, the, um, the course book. I have, I have my print edition somewhere, and uh, while I love reading it and 
my, my print version, it's, it's too cumbersome and slow. And have that handy if it helps you. I would also um, find some way to do math in a way that you find useful. So I said using R as a calculator, you can use, use a calculator on your PC, break out, you know, your TI-85 or even just a regular, you know, calculator, a simple calculator or your iPhone or your phone. I also like to sometimes to help me think things through. I like to have, just have blank pieces of paper and I like to write with that. It helps me think through a problem. Okay. There are three parts to the exam and familiarize yourself with what I, I said before, sort of the arc of the exam, the sort of like the, the story arc of the exam before, before you even take it. You should know this by the time you sit down and start the exam because there's no, there are going to be no surprises. There are three parts. First part is 15 multiple choice questions. The second part consists of 10 numerical answer problems that require typing the answer directly. And you should round to two decimal places unless otherwise stated. And the third part consists of, um, looks like uh, three multiple choice answers uh, questions. I think that might've been an old, older version, um, but, but that's more of a critical evaluation of, um, of, of the practice of, of statistics. So obviously if you can see um, what it says here, it says please answer all multiple choice questions by choosing the best answer. Um, now, what does best mean? It's pretty, un we've taught this course enough times, there is a correct answer. There's no trick here. Um, unless, unless you're really skilled at, uh, at uh, linguistic ledger domain, really, I, I've encountered many, hundreds of students have taken uh, the, the exams and we've written the questions and rewritten them and added more. And I haven't found a convincing rebuttal yet. I'm not biased. I'm, I'm, I'm the first person to admit a, a flaw, but I think when you look at the multiple choice, uh, responses, it's, the other ones are, I, I, there is no second closest best answer. That's what I'm trying to say. There's always a clear answer and then there are others that are patently incorrect. Um, so let me break this down. Okay, you got 15 multiple choice questions. So there's always going to be an answer there. So if you're running out of time, pick, pick one. Um, the numerical answer problems, um, uh, there are a couple things to say about that. T make sure you type in the correct answer. I've seen typos before and I've seen students get dinged for that. Now, when you type in the num um, numerical answer, we're just asking for a number. There are no dollar signs, nothing else. But make sure that you round it to two decimal places and make sure that you're using the appropriate uh, unit, for example. If we're asking for a proportion, you wanna have a, a, uh, a value between zero and one because a proportion by definition is, is, a, uh, is a decimal place, as opposed to a percentage, which is bound by zero and one. Now, here's something about exactitude and, and the rest. Because of something called midpoint rounding, which means that if you sort of round at various stages of your calculation of, of the answer, you might come up with some discrepant uh, responses, right? You know, let's say we, we want to, you to find out what, um, I don't know, the average grade among boys is plus the average grade among girls. And then we want to know what the sum of those two are. That's just a wildly, um, hypothetical answer. You could at, you could um, average to 16 decimal places um, the, the average grades for boys and then round for girls and then you could add it and you'll come up with a very different answer when you round the final answer than if you just rounded 
um, those intermediate steps. You have the rounded for boys, the rounded for girls. You'll have a discrepancy there. We have a, a margin there. You might see that even in, in the responses. There'll be something like margin. Um, that's not for you to fill out. It's something you'll see after the exam um, when you get the answers. All that means to say is that we incorporate the fact that your answer might vary by some trivial degree based on rounding the inputs, the values. So in other words, we are not looking for the exact, exact answer. Um, in other words, to you know, 12 decimal places. Um, that being said, my advice for answering the question is to use all available information for the inputs and then round the final answer to two decimal places. That's what I would do. Round the final answer. Do not round halfway through just because it's actually really bad practice. Don't do that. It's called midpoint rounding. It's controversial, but don't do it. Um, this seems pretty basic, but it's actually kind of debatable. So there are some you know, computer scientists out there or some engineers who might you know, dispute this, but um, if you have 2.50 and we want you to round up for whatever reason, um, actually, let's say we have a, th a number with three decimal places, 2.50. One, three, five. Then you're going to round that uh, 2.13 to a 2.14. You're going to round up if you have a five in your third decimal place. Not everyone does that, but that's my advice. That being said, it should be really in inconsequential if you decide to round the, the in the middle of uh, your estimation of the answers. But Here's the main point. You're probably going to take a little bit longer for that, and you probably want to double check those answers to make sure that you don't have typos. Um, that's when I took the exams, the numerical answer problems is when I use most paper. You know, I like to write down the equation, write down the inputs, and then answer it that way. Okay. Um, part three, the multiple choice questions. Um, it's, this might sound similar to the first part, but it's actually more difficult, and those are worth more points. Um, I'll give you the formula, kind of a formula for this. Um, this it, 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 typically, we might introduce you to a well-intentioned but completely misinformed um, practitioner or purveyor of statistics, and we want you to identify the best answer that recognizes the error committed by this person. So a simple example might be um, a journalist for the New York Times had found that um, as um, ice cream sales increased, so did um, uh, death due to heat stroke. Um, it seems that there's something in the ice cream that, that might make people um, overheat, right? What's the problem with this? Well, the, the answer um, in, in most introductory stats books is, and if I gave you more details, you, we would give you enough information for you to identify that ice cream sales increase during the summer months, which are hotter, um, and during the hotter seasons, um, death due to heat stroke or, or from overheating is more likely. So it's a classic example of a, spur, a, spur, a spurious correlation interpreted by someone who might provide a somewhat compelling theory, um, but is, is wrong. Now, the examples we give might be a little more difficult, but the strategy here is read carefully what they're doing, what they're saying, and think critically. This is less about statistics than it is about being an effective and literate consumer and um, communicator of statistics because I can tell you <laughs> open the newspaper open everything you will find bad statistics everywhere 
And this is, this is the skill that I think is indispensable. And that's our goal there is, is to, to aid you in um, the practice of informed, effective um, statistical reasoning. So, the, so to break it down, I would say the first part is 15 multiple choice questions. Um, that's more about content, really. It's more about the nuts and bolts of the information. Second part is uh, the numerical answers. That really is some, it's not on math, but it's basically using some of the core uh, statistical concepts to interpret and engage with the data to extract information um, from the data provided. And then the last part is almost more humanistically, it's more about, um, it has really nothing to do with math and more to do with clear thinking about statistics. Okay, not, now given that those three sections exist in the practice exam, they exist in the final exam, and um, they, uh, how do I put it? They, um, none of them are gotcha questions and all of them cover the content in, in the course that we have so far. Um, in terms of the open book portion, I would strongly recommend, I would assume that for the multiple choice questions, you may need to use um, some of the, the open book elements to remind yourself of a particular concept. Um, you know, Chebyshev's rule or something like that. For the numerical answer questions, you're probably more likely to need to refer or refresh your memory for particular um, equations like the multiplication rule and the addition rule. Um, and that's it, basically. It says here, when you do complete the exam, you will see all of the correct answers. Um, that I believe is not the case for um, the exam until the um, time period, the window of um, the exam is over. So keep in mind, while you have a two hour window to take the exam, you must take that exam um, within the designated time, um, time allotted. Now, um, so, in a way, this is almost like a, I think of this as like a, a, a um, how do I put it? I don't know, uh, uh, renting a, a, a video from, from iTunes. You can um, purchase the rental and it'll last for 30 months, or th yeah, 30 days. But once you start the video rental in iTunes, then you will have 48 hours to complete it. Similarly, you will have um, approximately three days to um, finish the exam, we have a three-day window. So you can start at any time, day or night, during that period, but you have to finish by midnight. Um, and I'm trying to remind myself, what is the date here? Um, I know it was in the announcement, but... Um, it, it, if you look at the announcements, you'll, you'll actually see, I think someone might help me with that. I, 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 yeah, so it, thank you, it is the 25th. So the 22nd to the 25th, I believe it is 11.59 p.m. the 25th. Um, so that's when the exam closes. In other words, not only would you, if you started the exam one hour before the window, before the midnight on the 25th, not only do you have less than 120 minutes to complete the exam, you also, um, you just can't complete it at all. You won't have time, even if you're supposed to be allotted 120 minutes. In other words, don't take the exam less than two hours or I would say three or four hours before the um, window of uh, the exam period ends, okay? Ideally, you might wanna take it um, several hours before just to be on the safe side, because there could be technical difficulties or something. But just keep that in mind. So you have two hours to take the exam, but that's once you start. And again, I'm gonna say this for the fifth time, once you start, the clock is ticking. So, 
Um, you will not see the correct answers until everyone has completed the exam. And that will be, I think it's automatic. We tried to do this. So it should be by midnight Eastern Standard Time on the 25th. If you want to stay up, you can do that. But um, that's when you'll get the exam um, answers and uh, the correct ones and the incorrect ones. And you won't get that before then because, of course, let's say if I took the exam on the 22nd and got the answers, and then, some, then, then we'd be able to share answers. That's a good, so someone had asked an important question. Would we, lock that, would we be locked out of the exam if the browser window closes or if our computer shuts off? Okay, I do not think that is the case, um, but the clock will still be ticking when you start your computer. So this is about um, what I call, you know, in, in cooking, they'll call it the mise en place, right? This is before you start to cook your, your, your great meal, you want to get everything ready. So that means make sure your computer is charged. Um, make sure you, you um, well, don't accidentally, of course, close the browser, but ideally make sure your computer is charged. I would recommend that you pick a quiet, comfortable place. I know a lot of us have jobs and families. So, you know, maybe you can ask your partner if you have kids, hey, could you take care of the kids for a while? Um, and I would make the place as comfortable as possible. Um, make it cool, comfortable, bring an extra sweater or something. I've always been told, you know, when I took graduate entrance exams, when I you know, to get to, into Harvard, um, one of my mentors said, treat it like a camping expedition because <laughs> you might be too cold, you might be too hot. Be prepared for those. Get something to drink. I know this may seem basic, but get something to drink. Have something sweet and sugary, a banana, fruit, snacks. Um, there has been ample research on exams, and um, there is a, a social a social psychological phenom phenomenon called stereotype threats that I do not want anyone to feel at all. Stereotype threat is this idea. It's, a, it's shown in, by a psychologist named Claude Steele that people who either are underrepresented minorities or in general feel like they don't belong or don't deserve to do well, that is they feel the burden of a stereotype that they don't deserve to do well or they're not capable of doing well in a stats course at Harvard, they will, their performance will be compromised. And it's a, it's a pernicious problem um, because it has to do with the emotional aspect. And I can tell you when I took exams, my first exams at Harvard in the Harvard halls, it can be really austere and intimidating. And I don't want to, anyone to feel that way. I mean, it's the, the good news is, is you can make it your personal spa, turn on some nice music because there's nothing to be afraid of. And the whole premise behind this idea of stereotype threat is that it is something that is unrelated to innate academic ability and it has everything to do with um the way that um people you know i guess the way that um dominant institutions intimate literally intimidate uh, people into underperforming and that's just more of the emotional trick and i can tell you almost everyone i know has something called the what is also called the imposter syndrome going to harvard teaching at harvard working at harvard you're going to meet no one feels like they belong it's Harvard, right? <laughs> what do you expect? Um, but if you if you can try to manage that, that that's that's to your benefit. And I can, I hope, just explaining that to you and recognizing that is also helpful. I mean, that's how I take exams. I would literally, I don't know, probably do it with a snuggie, listening to nice music, and um, you know, having snacks. Anyway. Um, that's just the emotional part of, of life and of, of test taking. 
now, and I've seen, by the way, I, the reason I'm pointing that is I've seen, I've talked with many students who have seen a rather large discrepancy, not many, but some, between their practice exam and then their actual exam. And there, I could not see any reason why except of the anxiety that might be produced from the exam period. Um, so that's why we give you the practice exam. Treat that as a real deal if you can. And, uh, you know, it's just practice. Um, and rem remember, the midterm is only one component out of uh, many parts of the course. Okay. That's, that's really my philosophy of, of taking exams. Um, I, we have the note about academic integrity. Um, please don't risk that. Um, this is, it's definitely not worth it. Um, um, it just, just really is. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm not going to say anything else about that. Um, you'll see some stuff here that, that isn't actually relevant, but, um, just let me show this to you. This is of course the, um, practice final exam, but you'll see here, you'll see like a, um, You'll see the labels here, you'll see multiple choice, and you'll see the answers here. 15 multiple choice worth three points each, so the multiple choice is, um, that's 45 points, so it's quite a bit of points, but they're all kind of not, you know, how do I put it? They're not that large um, by each one. Now, um, what I recommend you do with all of the multiple choice, well, first of all, this is, how I, this is how I recommend you take the exam. I already told you everything you should know, so by the time you, you hit ready to send or ready to start, you should have your snacks out, you should have the kids out to the ice cream parlor, um, you should have a room comfortable, you should be feeling good about life, and maybe schedule a reward after you take the exam. Now, you should also know this, that you, since you have three parts, Studies show that the most effective way to take an exam is skim it. Take a look at the long view. Don't read it like a mystery novel where you get surprised at the end. Skim it and triage it. So take a look at the ones that are most difficult and ones that are not. So we already know the structure. We already know what, what these are. But you might want to just sort of skim just to see what it's like. So here I'm skimming really quickly. And I'm already seeing, okay, there's some R outputs. Um, some of these answers have numbers, some of them don't, and then numerical answer this is going to look identical. Um, these are worth more points each. Um, so that's 40 points. So that means that's five points for the last three. Um, you don't really need to read this because this is what we already told you. But just keep in mind you want to, might want to skim that. And then you'll see more R outputs. And critical evaluation, these are the five point ones. We can't give you partial credit on these ones. Um, it does say round your answer. I don't think we have that. But look at the amount of text here. This is what you're going to look for here. You're going to look at the text. So you do see some output. You see some more text. Um, and you see some multiple choices. What I did there was I just wanted to see how much I had to read, how much of it was our output, um, how much of the answers were really multiple choice, and if there were multiple choice, how many options I had. And then you can sort of, that took two or three minutes with a lot of talking. What that means to me is for this incarnation of the exam, I want to make sure that I, I budget enough time for those last 15 points to carefully read and take notes on those vignettes. There's a lot of text there. I also want to be prepared to interpret accurately the R output. So if you're savvy with R, maybe you want to crack it open. Um, and the last thing is, I would say, I may want to start with one section over another if I feel less confident about that. Personally, I would probably go through order the order and just time it and see how long it takes. And if I'm too slow or if I'm getting anxious, I might then think about skipping ahead. And I'm thinking about all of this while still budgeting some time to double check some of the answers because I'm that kind of person. And here's why you might want to double check. After you, let's say you after you completed everything, 
before you hit that submit button, if you have minutes left, here are some things that, that, that are most common when uh, students are almost right, but they're not. The multiple choice responses might um, have one word that is different than the correct answer. It might be, the opposite, might be stating the opposite of the correct answer, um, which would mean that you might miss one or two words. So reread your final answer and see if that accords with what is being said. I, read, I would actually read it aloud just to make sure that you're not skipping over a word um, because some answers might be like, um, the p-value is, um, is greater than 0 0.05. Um, and the next one might be, the, the p-value is not greater than 0 0.05. You might answer the second one if it were incorrect, skipping mentally the not there because all the other the rest of it is correct of course the sentences we have are sometimes longer but that's important because it's easy for us especially if we feel rushed to skip over some of those details but that's where the multiple choice can be very tricky and um, not to be not not to be not intentionally but in the sense that words have meaning <laughs> if I say the sky is blue and then if I say the sky is not blue those mean entirely different things, even though those, those two statements differ by one word. Okay, in terms of double checking, if you also have time, I would um, just double check that you actually at least have the format of the numeric response correct. So maybe you make sure you don't have a, a jammed key, make sure you have two numbers, make sure you have two decimal places. Um, Make sure you didn't put a decimal place in front of everything, whatever. Um, and for the last one, um, for the critical responses, I think th that might take more time to double check, but just, again, make sure you're reading the answer, read the answer aloud, and sit with it and ask yourself, is this the right one? That's what I would do if you have time. If you don't, that's okay too. And if, as I said before, if you're totally running out of time, fill in those multiple choices at least. Okay, now I'm going to tell you what not to do. In addition to not starting the exam um, right at the end of, of, the, of, the, um, tr you know, of the exam period, um, don't take the exam, I would say, if you're feeling kind of tired or stressed or whatever, or if you feel like, uh, you, you know, it's just not sitting with you. It's always better to sleep on it and try to take it in the morning if you can. Um, do not take the exam um, in a public place because who knows what can happen. I've talked to students about that. When you're taking the exam, do not um, read the multiple choice answers and then come up with an answer that will only confuse you. Because there are a lot of, when you look at, I'll just show you one example if we can. Um, let's take a look at this one, these are incorrect. You see some output here. Um, do not, let's say if we didn't know what the correct answer was, you read the question and then you decide to read all of those uh, multiple choice responses and then you decide to answer the question, that is not the way to go. I would, don't do that, please don't. Instead, intentionally cover up that and read the question. Be very careful by the question. Do not get distracted by the R output either. There's a lot of extraneous information there. That's what output is. Read the question and ask what it is asking. You are a biological anthropologist studying the correlation between people's weights and their father's weights. You obtain the results below based on a random sample from a population. Which of the following is a correct statement? So, already I have, and I, you can't really answer it from here, so that's going to be a little tricky. But you're probably going to say, from the output, you can sort of say, well, 
Um, well, this is, to be fair, this is not going to be as accurate uh, as useful. Um, because if you, you might, you, in some cases, you will have to read the actual options here. I still would try not to read it too much. <laughs> I'm, I would actually just, in a way, look at the one answers that are similar. If you notice, this is very similar to this one, the correct answer. 95% confident, 95% confident. And then we have two that are quite different. Already, um, I'm going to know that we reject the null hy um, uh, hypothesis. And we already know there's a confidence interval there. So I know some things about here that you will learn in the course. But yeah, this is uh, so this is a good example of of actually how you, you might have to read the the, the possible answers, unfortunately. Um, don't worry about, about that, but if you can, if you can't answer without um, getting tangled up in the word salad of possible answers, I strongly recommend that you do that, and that is definitely the case with most of the questions in the first, in the midterm. Um, it's not the case here, unfortunately. Uh, so at the very least, try to avoid getting tangled up in these things, because some things can seem almost true. In fact, I, I'm, I think I could run this by some people and they might think it's true. This sentence here, which is incorrect, is different than this answer here, which is the only correct one. And they differ by only one word, this word sample, and then population. There's a reason for that. We don't need to go through it here, except that to say that we're t in the second half, we talk about inferential statistics, uh, statistics, which means that we're making an inference about a population. We don't talk about the sample here. There's no such thing as a 95% confidence interval for a sample. Um, but that's a good example of how rereading an answer very much helps. Um, it's also an example of how careful thinking requires precise interpretation of, 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 of statements. Because this is what statistics is about. It's about a principled interpretation of the data at hand. So it isn't just to be mean that we're, we're saying one word is incorrect than the other. One is fake news, fake science. One is incorrect and the other is correct um, but quite often fake interpretations or false interpretation can sound very convincing rhetorically but they don't so you'll see that the numbers are correct here for instance but that's not it so this is more about language here but I, I, I worry about this sometimes because I think students will see the numbers here they'll wonder where they are and then you know They'll see that, well, okay, I have to round these. This is actually where the confidence interval is. And it can get into sort of like a little eddy here. Don't spend too much time about it. Remember, there's three points. Um, so when you can, try to do that. Um, let's see. There are some other ones having to do with interpretation. Um, so if you notice, most of them have about four answers, or four, four possibilities. Um, and they almost all have R output. Um, you don't need to understand this R output, just um, understand and interpret the R output available. Um, it asks, um, you know, here's another one about what you conclude, and here's some sentences here. Um, so I, I, it looks like with the inferential stuff, maybe it's not as useful to um, to actually give an answer because you can make several conclusions here, except right here, um, it has the test of what you're trying to figure out. So it has, you're conducting a test to look at something, you have the outputs, and what do you conclude? 
you can already answer that question without actually looking at the answer. So, so this is like question eight, even though it's not for the practice midterm. Um, it's a good example of how you're conducting a test to figure something out, and that's clear. And then uh, we have the outputs, and then you can come up with a clear answer. I mentally come up with the answer by looking at that. So we want to know about the difference in average of, of hours work between those considered young adults to those who are not. So we're looking at, at difference in means. And then here I look at the p-value, and it looks like um, it looks like uh, those who are um, 30 years or older um, work more hours, and that I reject the null of no difference. I know that's beyond this materially, but conceptually, intellectually, from a strategy point of view, it's the same. What I did is I looked at the question, looked at the output, I answered the question. I already have that in hand, so I'm not going to get confused and, and spend time reading four sentences. I'm going to find the one that works, and there it is. I reject the null hypothesis that they're the same, they're different. And then I don't really have to read this junk. As long as this is correct, and then I, I might reread that. Okay, um, these are other ones. You'll see there's a lot of output here. You'll see some questions that have ants, some, some references here. Um, when in doubt, skip ahead and answer the question and just flag it, make a note, maybe in a sheet of paper that, you, that you'll revisit it if you have enough time based on, your, on lack of certainty. Um, here, I didn't answer it. Um, this is a, something that you might see. You could even see this in, in our exam, except um, not really. But it's the same format. Keep in mind that these are worth slightly more points. Um, but basically, um, it, it, has, it, tell, it gives you a, tells you what you are. Um, it asks a, a very particular question, and with the numeric uh, responses, you should be able to answer it, um, you know, fairly, fairly accurately. Um, and this is the way I answer these kinds of questions: is I write down what the question is, I write down the relevant information, and I write down the equation or information that is required. And then I plug and chuck it into a calculator, and it's pretty simple from there. And that, here's what I showed you before about what this whole margin thing means. The answer here is 0.84. You don't have to type a zero there. But if you type in 0.84, um, that's the on-the-nose correct answer. But if you round by a little bit, and you write in a 0.83 or 0.85, you're also considered correct. If you write 0.86, you're incorrect. I know that may seem like a very small margin, um, but that, that is, um, the computer will still, or, you know, or, or the software will still read it as a correct answer. Um, as long as it is within those margins. And that is essentially going to be larger or smaller based on how small the number is or, or how how discrepant the answer is, can be. That being said, as I said before, round the last question. Okay, around the la final number is what I would do. Um, and don't type in more than two decimal places. Point, um, important points, let's see if we can find this. Um, here you see something that is the correct answer is 0.5. So technically it's 0 0.50. I think you can leave the, the zeros out, but I would probably put in the zeros. If you have an integer, like five, like three, three, I would type in 3.00 just to be sure. Um, obviously, um, keep in mind that you should have a, a directional sign, so put in a negative if it's a negative answer. Otherwise, leave it as is. That's, that's about it here, but you can even see the answer that I provide here. This is using our, our code. Um, some of these have margins of zero because there's really no, you know, no discrepancy that's possible. Um, let's say if I want to take you to critical evaluation, let's say we went through all of this. Maybe you're a little tired. If you can try to take a break, take a break, get a glass of water, stretch. Coffee helps. If you're not a big coffee drinker, it's actually shown to uh, 
to to uh, be effective for attention. This is this is where it might be quite a bit. Um, we're not going to read this, but just keep in mind, this is a vignette. We have a sociologist saying whatever they're saying, but look at that question. What is not wrong with the sociologist's claims? Well, okay, you have to know here that the answer we're looking for is going to be the one that is not wrong. So, just as, as critical evaluation identifies what is right, it also means recognizing what is wrong, what doesn't follow from the information provided. Um, so, this is a good example of how you need to be careful in, in responding because this is, this is a good example also of where you will have to most likely read every comment because you'll want to rule out the incorrect ones. You'll have to think about them. You'll have to justify, you know, why they're incorrect and which one is uh, correct. Um, so that means that does re this, for, for example, the, the critical evaluation answers, you know, will require you to think through each answer. But before you do that, I, what I do is I just have my blank sheet of paper and I will even write down the bits and pieces of information here. So like um, here they have simple random sample. I'm just not, not going to tell you what it says, but I'm just showing you what, what's important. We have a simple random sample. We have a categorical variable. Um, they, they test a hypothesis. And then it looks like they have an alternative. And then they have this and this. And I, I'd probably write it down that information. This is, this, is the, this is the information at hand. This is where our expert has bungled or is correct, and this is what you're responding to. They're not all the same, um, but for example, here's an educational researcher and who obtains regression output. This is a very kind of a real world, real world example. Maybe you have someone you're working with who, you know, is looking at trash collection in, in your local municipality. Maybe you work for the local planning department and they're showing you the outputs. And you're, you know, you as the experts of the city, not only are you there to interpret outputs, but you're also gonna talk with another researcher and to make sure that it's effectively used. And here we have another, this person making these claims. And then you want to, you see a different question. Which of the following invalidates the researcher's claims? This is a good example of where I would, before answering or looking at the answers, I would see if I can find out what's the problem with their logic beforehand. Get, you would have, have an idea of what's going on, what's, what's incorrect here, what doesn't follow. So you'll see these are more compound. These are, these are slightly more difficult. They require more time. Um, that's why they're worth more points. That being said, they're not tricks. I, you know, it's people who are tripping over themselves and you're basically saying, tie your shoelaces and then you won't trip. Um, but typically like this, when this person makes a claim and you have the data here and it's not um, worded um, and contrapositively in terms of the negative, you only need to find, um, identify one response that invalidates the claim. So you don't have to read all the, all the junk here, although that helps for you to rule out this one, but the, I, this correct, rule out the, the incorrect and find the correct answer. Ideally, you wouldn't do any guesswork, but if there is guesswork here, um, that's better than saying nothing. Sometimes when uh, we give you the answer, we will actually give you the, um, uh, a written response to. Here you see some more writing here, you see some more regression outputs. Which of the following invalidates the claims? Oh, we said that already. Uh, here's more outputs. What is wrong with the con economist's conclusions? This is another example if we're saying, asking you what's wrong with this? Read, interpret, decide, judge, and then look at the answers available. That just saves you time. You're not reading four answers. You're not getting falsehoods 
mixed in with reality. I'm just looking at this quote here. Um, these are all or nothing points, of course, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. So let's say I answered all of these and I went back up, then I'd probably, um, I, would, I would actually go to the numeric answers and, and, and recheck those. And that's basically it. And then you could hit submit. Um, that is my rather extensive walkthrough. It's about an hour long, but I think it's important to, to do. I mean, it's, it's good practice. Um, but as you see, um, quite often there's, there's some intuitive knowledge here that I think we're not exactly testing you on in the sense that um, if you haven't seen the regression output, um, that's only because you haven't been doing the homework. But of course, as long as you've been doing the homework, which most of you have, then you'll be fine. Um, okay, any other questions about the, the nature of the exam? If, if not, then I, I, I hope this was useful. I think it is. Um, and I hope that I, I think it'll result in, in uh, you doing very well. Let me say one more thing about the practice exam. If you can, try to take the practice exam under the same conditions as you would for the, for the midterm. Now, not, not everyone knows this. For the midterm and for the final exams, we have a, a, a question bank. That means we add questions, we, we remove questions. So while the structure is identical, you cannot, um, could someone mute? I, I hear some background noise. Um, I'm sorry, I'm hearing some noise. Um, if, if you could, could you, could you check to make sure that you're, um, you are muting yourself? Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Now, what I was, what I was gonna say is, for the practice um, exams, the answers are identical for everybody. So you could look over your neighbor's shoulder, um, you know, your neighbor's virtual sh shoulder and see what they had have in, in their exam. However, your exam is, um, no, no person's exam is completely identical for the midterm or for the final. Um, as I said before, we have a question bank, so we have a, a, a reservoir of, of questions, and we slot those in randomly into each of these uh, uh, three categories. Those do not affect the uh, outcome of the exam. They're, none are harder than the other. We looked at the analytics. We, we triple and check those. Those will not affect the exam. But it does mean that not everyone has in uh, the identical exam questions. They have the exa same exam structure, the same difficulty, but not the exact identical questions. We do that for obvious reasons, because we, we're not testing collaborative efforts. We don't want, um, you know, cheating or anything like that. Um, not that we assume that to be the case, but that's simply our insurance policy against uh, um, this uh, exam sharing, you could say. Um, that's, that's about it. Um, once the exam is released, I will, um, if you're in my section, um, uh, if, you're my, if I'm your grader, I will look at the exam as well, and I'll, I'll, I'll provide some feedback to you on that. I think it's a good time to do that because, uh, especially if there's some discrepancies, it's, it's now is the time to sort of tell you, okay, this is where you are, et cetera, et cetera. And no matter where you are, even if you're disappointed by your grade, um, keep in mind you still have the final, you have the final project, and you have all the other homework assignments, and then you have the class participation. So this is just one thing. Okay, I'm going to spend about a half hour on content. Any other questions?
So someone asked a great question. Would going over quizzes and missions be helpful for the midterm exam? Absolutely. If, if I were to do anything, I would only work, I would, after taking the um, practice exam, going over that, um, go over the quizzes and the missions, quizzes and the missions, quizzes and the missions. You want to get used to taking the exam, uh, taking those questions and just looking those over. Um, more than anything, I would say more than anything else. Um, yeah, I, I think that's one of the most important things. Um, the other thing is, if you have time, um, review the sections that are recorded. Um, I think you should be able to put in um, uh, uh, subtitles, play them at double speed if you like, and focus on those weeks that, that, that may have caused you greater trouble. If you go to the R tutorials page, I conceptually review every homework assignment. Um, I would recommend, based on most students' performance, I would recommend focusing on um, the, the homework assignments on relative risk and probability, um, and on contingency tables. That seems to be a particularly difficult week, so I would re-watch that one and focus on that homework assignment above if you had to pick only one homework assignment. Other than that, yeah, take the quizzes and take, take the other stuff. Um, if you don't have time for that, which is understandable, take the practice exam, see, see what happened, and review that, uh, the final review, um, review the, 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 the lecture notes, especially those dealing with um, the review of the first part of the course. And that's what we're gonna go to next. Any other questions? None? Okay. Um, let me get it open. So you should be able to go to the course website and download the slides for the last week. Um, And I do want to remind you, we're only dealing with the first six modules. We're not doing basics of sampling. I, I know that's repetitive, but I just want to repeat that till the ends of till the end of time. Um, simply because that seems to have been an issue before. Oh, so someone asked about question four in the practice exam. The answer seems to be incorrect. Well, I, I didn't. I don't want to review this, but uh, since more of you have joined, um, I will review. I won't review all of the um, midterm practice exam. I could, but it, it'll take too long, and I have a two-hour video on that. But yeah, I, I'm happy to review that. Um, Oops, I need, to, I need to share the screen. I'll do another share. Practice midterm, you said question four. Jay, is that, is that the one? Okay, correct. Okay. Well, since more of you joined, you know what I'll do? I, I decided I changed my mind a little bit because I think it, it is useful not just to review the exam, but also explain some of these answers and why some of them are correct and why they're not correct. Um, I apologize to those of you who, um, who haven't taken it yet, but um, already you can sort of see this one is uh, the same structure, right? 15 points, uh, sorry, 15 multiple choice, three points, four options, and, and as you can see, the questions are shorter, right? There's 
smaller. So here's the, here's the output. Output. Here's the question four um, that was asked. Um, I didn't do so well in this exam, right? If you can't read this, this is um, difficult to read, but this is extremely important, and I'm glad you actually brought this up. I was gonna. This is one of the, the four big things when we talk about left and right. Skew. Oh yes, please. Anyone else who has particular questions that you want to have addressed, flood flood me with them. Okay. Um, I'm I'm happy to to go over everyone, but I I, I also am mindful of your time. So. Um, the question of the first one have, having to do with um, my question, uh, sorry, four, is the answer seems to be not correct. The distribution is negatively skewed. Um, okay. Remember when I said, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sharing. Am I sharing this screen? Can you see this? Oh, yeah, you can. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Let me mark this up and I'll show you. Remember I said reading these questions, and this is a great example of um, you know the concepts, but the devil's in the details, as, as the saying goes, based on the graph below, which of the following is not true. So when we see not true, that means if we have four answers, and then I apologize, it's a little blurry here. We have four possible answers. That means three of them are true. One of them is not true. If we don't know which one is not true, you can at least it eliminate by process of elimination um, uh, the three that are not true. So the distribution is negatively skewed. That is the correct answer, which means that it is not true. Right, exactly. I'm, I, I didn't mean to be pedantic here, right? But the point is <laughs> that the not true means that we're looking for the mistake. And this is also another, another good example of why I don't like to, I personally would recommend, strongly recommend against looking at the multiple choice responses because um, these other three answers are correct and that is just extraneous information. It does, provides us with nothing that's useful, does not address the question. If I'm gonna reread something, I wanna reread the question. And that's because here we have the not true thing. Sometimes we're asking what is true, sometimes we're asking what is not true. So, you know, I, I trust me, I've, I've made this mistake many times. I can have a very precise answer, but it does not answer the question. Okay. Um, but this is a good example, I think I want a, a teachable moment. Um, when we talk about left and right skew, um, a right skew means you have a tail that goes all the way to the right. Left, um, left skew means it goes all the way to the left. So it's not where the lump is, it's where the tail is. Um, when I see a, a box and whisker plot like this, I actually um, see that there are outliers here. These are, if we can say, pretend this is income, this would be like, a, um, I guess Vladimir Putin, he's worth 200 billion. Here we have Bill Gates. Here we have um, Elon Musk, let's say. These are the wealthy people on our income scale. If this were rich, this were less rich. This is where most people lie. Fewer people lie here, but quite a bit. But these rich people, what are they doing? They're pulling that range all the way over. They're skewing our data. So that way, um, the average or the mean is going to be pulled um, higher than the median. And that's true for the first one. The mean is larger than the median. That means the average of whatever numerical variable there is, is going to be larger than the median, which is the middle value. This is the, pro the difficulty with skew, the problem with skew. Um, now the distribution is symmetric. Yes, it is symmetric. It is skewed and symmetric. When we talk about symmetric, we're simply saying um, it has a, it's a hill. It's not bimodal. Um, it's has a, has a one measure of central tendency. Um, you know, it's, it's not it's not multimodal. Um, and the distribution is indeed right skewed. 
So right skewed means you have people on the right that are pulling it to the right, left skewed, pulling it to the left. Great question. This is, this is also on my list. Thank you for asking these. I actually appreciate the questions that are being asked because these are things that, um, that students before have always had issues with and continue to have issues with. So I'm going to try to draw a histogram. So if we, if we could represent this thing here as a histogram, and it's going to look pretty bad, but I'll try it. Sorry, as a density plot, we might see something like this. Gosh, this is not that good. It's not going to be that jagged. But here is something that looks like this. So we can try to imagine that to be smoother. Um, I apologize. I really wish I could draw better here. I could bring up a, 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 a reading, but I, I don't want, I, I want to be efficient here. What I'm trying to show here is that you essentially have a distribution that if we imagine this to be curved, it goes up. And then you have some people who, are, who have higher values. And then you have these outliers here. Now, when you have that skew this way, um, actually, when you have a long tail to the right, it is right skewed, it is also positively skewed. Right. What's that? I'm sorry, I thought I heard something. So the point here is um, sort of, long tail to the right is a positive skew. I always think of the, think of income distribution. Average income of Harvard college dropouts is um, positive right skewed because Zuckerberg, Zuck and Gates are both um, Harvard College dropouts. They are pulling that distribution to the right, the positive skew. The negative skew um, or left skew is simply the inverse of that. If we had the opposite of Zuckerberg and Gates. If, if we were all as wealthy as they were, and then they were destitute. It just is the inverse of that. But the point here is about language is, um, if the bulk of the data is to the right, not ex skewing is to the left if the bulk of the data density is to the right. Exactly. So right skew is simply saying, think about what the word skew means. If you bought a car and the, and, the, and the axle was skewed, is that a good thing? No, it's distorted. If you um, bought glasses from Warby Parker and your vision was skewed, it's distorted. It's a skew. But that's the way I would think about it. It's a distortion. So it's not about where most data lie. It's not an accurate representation. It's a distortion that is right skewed if outliers are pulling the average to the right and misrepresenting this measure of central tendency based on the average. And it's positive, positive or right skew is synonymous. Left skewed if it's pulled to the left because of some uh, outliers there. Um, so skew is, is, when I see skew, I don't like to see that and it's bad. Yes, the point was, um, yeah, so another question, so thanks. Um, so another question is, oh, this is also about skewing. Um, in different, yeah, so I, I was trying to represent skewing in different ter ter types of graphs. Um, so since we don't have that example here, I will, um, I'll clear all the drawing and I'll actually find an example there because I don't like to, uh, I, I think it is better for us to have to see skew in different contexts. Most of the time you're gonna see it with, an, remember you're gonna see skew, not with categorical data, you're gonna see it with numeric data. So you're gonna see it with income, you're gonna see it with age. Um, 
You're not going to see it in a scatter plot because uh, you're, you're going to see it only in uh, a distribution of an, one numerical, one numeric um, variable. Because you're looking at the distribution, because skew describes the distribution of a numeric variable. So you're going to see it in um, density plots, histograms, um, box and whisker plots, anything that looks like some kind of mountain or whatever. So I just want to erase this and then and I'll show that. Is that all right? Um, we, are we still interested in looking at the other kinds of ways to look at skew? My personal opinion is that it's important, but. Um, if you want to ask other questions, that, that's okay too. Okay. Um, uh, sorry. Somehow, my computer... Okay, there you go. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm gonna. I, I'll, I'll take you to the, the to the readings because I think it is kind of important. Um, oh, actually, we'll go to the numerical data thing. Um, so this is on week three numerical data. I'm just gonna open those slides. Okay. Sorry for, sorry for these pauses here. I don't feel like we need in, interlude music. Um, okay. I want to do another share. This is actually from the, the course reading. Um, can you see it? I'm not sure if you can, but I'll do another share. This is from the Open Intro Stats book. Um, it's a good example of why Control F is your friend. Do you guys see the um, the, hit, uh, the the um, the distribution here of the histogram of um, looks like a, it's a, a frequency histogram of housing expenses in dollars. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is a histogram. It's a frequency. It's not of density, which means that each of these bars, um, these bins as we call them, um, gives us the relative frequency. Um, that's irrelevant, really. We, as, as statisticians, we're look, if anything, uh, if you can kind of blur your eyes a little bit and not look at the numbers, you kind of want to look at just the overall shape here. What do we have here? We have what is um, similar lo looking to that box and whisker plot we have in this question. This box and whisker plot has a, a, a hill, a mound here. So here we have the median. We have an interquartile range. We have 1.5 times the interquartile range, which simply means most of the, the summit of the hill is here. Most of the data are here. There's less here. And then there's this long right tail is positively skewed. This is what it would look like more or less. You have, you know, this measure of central tendency. You have the interquartile range right around here. Then you have, um, um, then you have, you know, what would probably be the whiskers extending out to here. And then you have this long tail here of these outliers. So that's what's pulling it right. Now, interesting enough, if we could imagine, right, um, if we could just erase everything but above 1,000, for example, well, then maybe it could look more bell-shaped. But this is, this is a pretty good example of something that is, uh, as they would say, strongly skewed of student housing prices, but it's also a good case of how the average is going to be higher than the median because the middle value is going to be right around 600 or so. But the average 
as we know how to calculate the mean or the average. We sum uh, the values and divide by the number of cases. And that means that we're going to include these very high dollar amounts that are going to push the average above the middle range rather than below. Now, that's what happens when you have positive skew, a right tail, or outliers. And that's a, an example there of, uh, in, in a histogram. If we can look at skew here, um, here's a histogram. This is also um, positively skewed. The bins are different. It's not even symmetric if you see this. There's no slope to the left. It looks like there's a, if you notice, if one of the, one of the correct answers to this was that the distribution is, sorry, it's asymmetric. It is, I don't know why I said symmetric. It is asymmetric. A skewed distribution is asymmetric. I apologize for saying that. That was, a, that was me missing one letter prefix. Skewed distributions are asymmetric because you can't do a window mirror here. You can ski down it but it's not like a bell, bell cave, bell curve. Um, in open intro stats, if you haven't looked at this in detail, some of these comments and boxes are helpful. Um, long tails to identify skew. When data trail off in one direction, the distribution has a long tail. If the, if the distribution has a long left tail, it is left skewed. If the distribution has a long right tail, it is right skewed. Well, Look at this right here. I'm moving from left to right, the tails to the right. That's right skewed. Positively skewed as well, because that's the number is larger. Um, if you look at these other kinds of distributions, you're not gonna run into these for the practice exam, but you'll see that um, Some of them are multimodal distributions, as I said before. So here you have some that you can kind of say there's a skew, but not really. This is about multimodal simply means there are many peaks, right? Most of the, what we talk about is there's one peak and there's going to be either left, uh, a right skewer or a left skew. Um, here's one that is not skewed. This is a symmetric distribution. This is our bell curve. It's the T distribution, in fact. Um, I say bell curve actually rather loosely here. T distribution is not a bell curve because um, its tails are thicker, if you recall. Um, but that dotted line right here is a bell curve. Okay. So that skew issue is, is an important thing. Um, here you have another question that is, says not. Um, Are there any other questions that you have for the practice exam? I'm happy to go over some of these more tricky answers. Yeah, 21. Okay, we're gonna go to 21. And I'm glad we're doing this because I did want us to um, go through some of the numeric numerical answers. Now keep in mind, it is as I said before. You have 10 questions, four points each. You want to round your answer to two decimal places unless otherwise specified. Um, okay. So this is where I'm going to write stuff down. And I'm actually going to um, I'm gonna open a little text edit box to see if I can, no, I won't do that. I'll actually type in the interface here because this is how I think I'll write it on a sheet of paper. But when I see this question, I see a lot of numbers and I see I have to write something in. First thing I want to know and I want to clarify for myself is I want to know, I want to clarify in my mind, what information do I have? Now, sometimes that's a little less efficient because um, you might end up writing information that is not uh what the heck is going on i'm sorry i'm gonna stop this i'm gonna try to do the new share and i'm gonna reshare because i couldn't uh do this correctly okay good now i'm gonna annotate with text and i will put this in a kind of a pink color here okay 
So first thing I'm going to do is I'm not even going to think about the question. I want to read this aloud. And as I said before, I often read aloud. I know it sounds silly, but it actually works. You're actually forcing yourself to think clearly about things. Okay. So the question is, suppose you gather a data set and find that the proportion of people living in poverty is 0.5. Okay. Proportion is a key word here. Remember I said proportion is always bound between zero and one. So here I'm going to write um, um, poverty pro proportion. I'm going to say that equal to 0 0.05, 0. Okay. So that's the first fact. And we also know the proportion of people living in poverty and supporting a living wage of $15 an hour is 0 0.30. So here we have prop um, um, poverty and actually I'm going to get rid of proportion because it's all proportions. So we have poverty, poverty and live wage. I'll just live, live wage is equal to 0 0.30. Okay. So we have one proportion and then we have a proportion of, of two. And now it asks to treat these proportions of probabilities. What is the probability? Again, this is a, purpo a proportion. This is from week five on relative risk and probability tables. Um, question, what is proportion of, of um, live wage given poverty equals? Okay. So a couple things we know. What else do we know? I'm sorry if that's overlapping. That's the information. So this is what we know. We know that we're dealing with proportions and probabilities. So the answer has to be point something or other. Um, we also know that we're dealing with a conditional probability. Why? Because the question here is given. What is, what is the proportion? of living wage given you're in poverty. So um, if we do something with and, um, I'm hearing background noise, if you could stop that for a second, please. Okay, so this is, this is where either you have it written out, you have the multiplication in, in the addition rules for proportions and probabilities, or you're going to go and open the lecture slides for week, um, I think it's week five. Um, I'll, I'll do it that way. Um, we can also just do the review. But this is a good case of, of identify. So the, the key rule here is, um, if I can open this, you have the information already, but what I did now is I recognize that because we're dealing with proportions and probabilities and we're having a, we're looking at the intersection of, um, we're looking at the, the, um, the unconditional probability or proportion, then we're looking at the um, union or, 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 or joint probability of two events. And we're asked to have estimate the the, um, the conditional probability or proportion. A lot of flags are, are are hitting me right now, and I'm thinking, oh, I know exactly where to look for this, because this is what we talked about when we looked at contingency tables and relative risk. But we're looking at the cont contingency tables, and we're going to look at those equations to see what equation we need to use when we look at this. So that's the really the key insight here is to identify this as a type of problem that we addressed. And from that, it's going to be a simple plug and chug. The math isn't hard here, but um, we're going we're gonna to open the notes here. And uh, I would be faster if I didn't have to uh, have the... Uh, 
have have the Zoom open. I I, I like to think, um, but so let's go to those notes. Um, So this is week four probability tables that I'm opening up. And this is, um, uh, this right here, do you see that? You have um, probability tables and relative risk. And we're gonna look at, um, I would put in a conditional probability. We don't need to know that. We don't need to know that. But we do want to know, actually I'll just type in the rule. We don't need to know the trees. I don't think we even test you on that. Um, oh, okay, sorry. I'm gonna share the screen. And this, I just brought up the lecture notes um, from week four, relative risk and probability. That's, that's probably the biggest challenge. Now, when I reviewed this section, you might want to look at the section video because I think this is probably the most important um, week to review because um, I actually even went through some of those um, issues here. Um, I apologize for scrolling through. Um, notice, though, that when we look at this, all we're doing is we're talking about the joint probability of something, probability of A and B, right? Probability of being... Um, Poor and living wage, I believe, was a uh, 0.3, and then the probability of, uh, say, just being poor was 0.5. So if I were writing this out, I'd actually probably use the language of A and B. Um, so we don't need to do all this. What part of what the task we have to do is we have to eliminate the information that is not relevant. Um, so I'm using this as it's not um, the question that we have here, but I just want to point out you should have this. I'd write this down or save it. We want to remember the addition rule and the multiplication rules. So the addition rule is here, but if you notice it's if we have two events and we want to know the probability of at least one of the events occurring, so it's A and B. So the probability of A or B. We're not asked, being asked that. We're not asking what is the probability of having a living wage or being poor. We're asking what is the probability of um, having a living wage if you're poor. So we want to look for something that's probability of A given B. So that's where we go. And you can also, you probably want to use two versions of the addition rule. They actually say the same thing, but um, there's the generalized addition rule. Um, let's, I'll just do that. So what we're going to use is the multiplication rule. Um, We're going to look at part two. What is the probability of A given B? That's how we write it. So this is the given. Well, it's, it's equal to the probability of A and B, the joint probability, over the probability of B. So when I'm writing this out and I see those as probabilities, if I couldn't type them out, I would have written on my own sheet of paper by hand. Um, I would have actually translated um, the terms to the logic here. So the probability of A given B, so if we have A being the living wage and B being uh, poverty, we're saying what is the probability of the living wage given you're in poverty? It's the probability of the joint of, of being both poor and having a living wage, which is um, 0.3, so that's in the numerator. 
So this is point three, and then B is the probability of being poor, which is point five. So here you see the math is very simple. You take point three and divide it by point five, and um, point three. I'm just doing the calculator on my computer. Divide by point five equals point six. And that is the answer. Now, the reason there's no margin there or no room for discrepancies is we give you complete information. There's no discrepancy there. Okay, so to review the logic of addressing this, write down what you know. Ideally, identifying the, the, the category of problem that we have. This is uh, contingency tables and relative risk. It uses um, the second part of the multiplication rule, um, but you might also want to use the addition rule. And it helps to know how to write out and interpret the, the multiplication rule because it helps you to translate the problem into the language of, of statistics. So you can estimate this rather quickly because the math here is not that difficult. The biggest Difficulty, I'd say, is taking the leap from here to the module or the week that in which we address that question. And that's where control F kind of helps. But I'd also, for me, I would write out the multiplication rules. And I would actually review, if I were to review any homework assignment, it would be the one on relative risk and, and probabilities. Okay, that was a good question. It's, it's not that easy, but it's, uh, it's good. Um, any other questions? And also, did that answer that help? Okay, thank you. Someone's asking question 24. The question in particular asks, should we have a minus sign in our answer? And that's a great question because signs matter, right? Um, if you write negative one and the answer is one, then it's incorrect. So let's read this question. A test measuring empathy was given to Harvard and Yale students. The test is scored on a scale from one to 100 highest empathy. The test scores were then converted to z-scores. A Yale student has a z-score of negative two, while a Harvard student has a z-score of positive 1.5. How many standard deviations apart are the scores of the two students? Okay. What is it? So this requires you to know what, say, uh, a standard deviation is in, in z-score terminology. I'll give it to you. Standard deviation is one. It's asking for a distance. So if I say I'm here and you're here, I'm I'm asking what's how how far are these two apart? Um, the intuition is you want to know how far apart they are. Well, the Yale student is two standard deviations below. So we take two, because um, and then we add 1.5, and that equals 3.5. So it's not negative, it is positive, because a positive is a measure of uh, the number of standard deviations. There's no such thing as a negative standard deviations apart from anything. It would be as if you were to say, I am negative miles or negative, kilometer, negative 10 kilometers from my cousin. Doesn't, doesn't exist. Yeah, it, it's a language issue. Um, and it's an important question because you could ask the question where the sign is important. Um, you could ask, um, not how many standard deviations are part of the z-scores of the two students, but um, I'm trying to think of how, how, how I would answer this. Um, well, I, I can't think of it now, but often if you do comparisons, you want to know um, how much lower something is than someone else. Um, right, if you wanted to say how many standard deviations lower, 
Uh, well, that, that wouldn't even work as well. I mean, that's the difficulty with dealing with z-scores with talking about negative and positive signs. Keep in mind that a z-score is standardized so that the mean is zero. One is a standard deviation, which is the on average, how far does the value lie from the mean? So because it is a uh, descaled or standardized measure of, of, of discrepancies, it doesn't lend itself well to um, ideographic or idiosyncratic interpretations. By definition, it's, it's, it's standardized. Um, but there's a little bit of a trick here. I think there's an Easter egg. This here, the, this in, bit of information is absolutely useless. It's more of a distraction. The test is scored from a scale from one to 100 highest empathy. That's just folder all there. But I think that's, that's a good example of, while well, it does give you information about what the exam is, it doesn't help you answer the question because it could be from one to a million. I don't care because it, it doesn't help me understand what the z-scores say because these scores are standardized. I hope it's not too tricky. Um, <laughs> so it's, someone mentioned it is tricky. Um, I don't think it's it's entirely tricky if we can identify that Z, if, I always think of these as flags or keys here. Z-score, oh yeah. Z-scores, what do they do? Well, they help us compare different kinds of exams or they look at the relative dis differences between values, even if the metric is different. And um, it would be tricky, I would say, if if we gave you this standard deviation that was unstandardized, that would be, really bad but yeah it's, it's kind of tricky this is statistics um, but it's also another example of why we don't have a margin um, there's no room for error here okay any other questions okay we have about five minutes left I want to tackle one of these critical evaluation examples we went through some numerical questions, we went through multiple choice, we went through the sort of how to approach this stuff. I want to go to critical evaluation. Um, I'm trying to um, see which one would work. Um, they all have explanations. Um, but I want to do this last one on um, regression. Um, it's one that students yeah yeah this is the it's question 28 was the one that, that students had more difficulty with um, so the question 28 you'll see the descript the, the the writing here is smaller right um, a criminologist studies whether the population size of cities in the United States predicts murder rates okay predicts um, okay so we can already identify that we have two numeric variables. We want to look at prediction, so we know it's a simple linear regression. There's no comment about correlation. We also know that if these, with these numeric variables, um, the predictor variable is some numeric value um, that is an indicator of population size, and that's x. And y, the outcome variable, is the murder rate, some other numeric variable. Okay, we already know that. Um, the criminologist finds that the coefficient for population size predicting murder rate is 0.45 and that the intercept is 1.29 with an R squared of 0.08. Okay, in my review of uh, simple linear regression, uh, we talked about the, the three elements of a, of a, of a regression. Is, uh, the, two, the two fundamental ones are the slope and the intercept. The slope is... Um, the rise over the run, or or the angle of the um, uh, of the uh, the association, and um, intercept is the value of y when x equals zero. The last point is um, r squared. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been talking this much. Thank you for raising your hand. I'm sorry, Fatima. Um, someone else. Uh, I apologize. I don't like the sharing stuff. 
Okay. Now you should see this. I apologize. I'm just reading this, this stuff right here. First, I described this, and I was, I'm, I'm being a little bit I'm much slower than I would when taking this exam, giving you an idea of what information you can glean. Also, what information um, is provided here, just as a review of, uh, of the simple linear regression. This 0.45 is a slope, which means that it tells us how much y increases with every one, in, uh, increase, one unit increase in x. The intercept is 1.29. That's the value of y when x equals 0. r squared is not part of the simple linear regression equation. It is a proportion uh, of variance explained by uh, city size. Um, that's the information. Now there's a little bit of a trick here. The coefficient for population size predicting murder rate is 0.45. That is the slope. And it may not be entirely clear. That's why I focus a lot on, on what a coefficient is. But remember, a coefficient uh, is, is the slope here. And a positive coefficient means that for every one unit increase in population size, the murder rate increases by 0.45. That's a positive slope. We don't have any other context about magnitude, what it means, or the units, but we know that they're quantitative, the numeric rather, and that this positively associated. We also know that there, there's R squared, which is eight, that means that 8% of the vari variation in Y is explained by X. Now that's a lot of information. You may or may not need to use all of it, but I just showed to you how much information is there. What I would do actually is I would, to save time, I would actually go with whatever this criminologist is saying that's incorrect. We really have a lot of incorrect experts here. He concludes based on these simple linear regression model results that population size causes higher murder rates. What is wrong with the criminologist's conclusion? This is a good example because look at all the time I wasted writing down all the information before I, before I um, got to the question. So, especially when it, a, it sometimes depends, uh, and I know I've been endorsing writing down the information that's available, but make sure you read the question so you don't write down every little bit of information here, because I could have wasted a lot of time writing down a bunch of irrelevant stuff because I didn't know what the question was. What is wrong with a criminologist's conclusion? It's this word here, right? This is more about interpretation. This is not the numbers. So um, prediction and, and simple linear regression model, um, you can't claim a causal effect. What purports an association, right? Despite, so the answer we provide is, despite the model results suggesting a strong association between population size and murder rates, it is incorrect to claim a causal effect based on just a regression model without additional assumptions, the model and the data support only evidence of an association. Um, some of these other answers, if they're a little blurry, I'm not sure why, but uh, if you look at them, they almost sound correct, um, but it's a good example of, uh, I think, of, of how you, you, know, you might get tra trapped up in something. Um, the first one here, for example, that, uh, seems kind of correct. The criminologist is claiming a causal effect. That's true but his regression coefficient is too small for there to be an association. That's not true. So here you see a hybrid of something that is true and then something that is kind of true because it is a pretty small coefficient, I think, but you don't really know the units, so you can't be that sure. Um, so that's incorrect. Um, and the second incorrect answer, the criminologist is claiming a causal effect. Again, that is true but his intercept is too large for there to be an association. Uh, that doesn't make any sense, but it's a good example of how extraneous information might cloud what is actually a relatively elementary um, answer 
And I think that's a big challenge with data and stats today is separating the wheat from the chaff. I've worked with many statisticians and it's a challenge we have all the time is we have way too much data. Sometimes we don't know what to make of it. Um, third point, the criminologist is claiming a causal effect, but his R squared is too low for there to be an association. Okay, so all three of them have elements of truth to them, right? They do acknowledge that the claim is being made. And they're kind of correct in a way. The coefficient for the slope is pretty small, it's smaller than the intercept. Um, the R squared of 0 0.08, I would see that, consider that to be a pretty small um, um, coefficient. However, those tell us nothing about the interpretation of the facts at hand. So these are good examples of, the reason I'm reading these uh, incorrect answers is, I think those are also teachable moments, those are helpful for understanding why interpretations are wrong. It's not useful just to know what's right, but also why is something wrong? And I recommend you do that for the rest of the practice exam. Read these over and understand why it's incorrect. Um, because that is also helpful. So um, we don't have time to do that here, but I will post that to the, to the, um, to the website. Okay. Um, any other questions? Any other thoughts? Someone is asking for extra credit. We don't have extra credit. What we do have, however, is um, we do give you an extra time, uh, opportunity to redeem yourself with the first half of the course material because the final exam covers um, the first six weeks as well. In a way, that's to in a major way that's to your benefit because. It actually means that the final exam is not just the last half, it is a, a revisit of the first half. And the first half is, from what we know, easier than the second half. Um, still, I would say the second half is harder, but it is to your benefit to take in the final exam to have, a, a, say, 30% of your questions addressing concepts that are going to be very familiar with you because you've already taken practice exams and the midterm on them. Other ways to uh, make up for, for that is um, any perceived shortcomings. Remember, we have participation credit. We also have uh, uh, your final project. That, those factor hugely into your final ex uh, grade. And um, yeah, any of the problem, any have the problem sets. I'm sorry, I, I, I have an alarm. Uh, we also have the problem sets, and you can drop your uh, lowest mission if you haven't done so already. So, well, that's not extra credit. It is certainly a lot of credit in one small piece. That being said, when you're asking for extra credit, I fear that you are anticipating um, not doing well. I have more hope for those of you. Um, don't. I would. I would, don't want you to worry. I don't even want you to even think that you wouldn't do well. Um, so yeah, I guess I'd say no extra credit. Now, please tell us if you have a email your the, the teaching staff if you encounter any technical difficulties or any bizarre things. That sh those should not happen. However. Um, we, we, those haven't happened yet, but let us know. But I think I think you'll do fine as long as you um, you know, take this, take my advice, and, and really, the biggest thing I've seen is what I spent the most time on, or a large chunk of time. Make sure you have a place to study and you have your material ready. Two hours is actually quite a bit of time, um, believe it or not. I know I spent two hours talking, but I made things much slower this time. Any other questions, any other comments? Otherwise, I think we're just about out of time. Okay, um, don't be a stranger. We will post much more material, including all of the detailed answers to the practice midterm for this. And um, I believe, I think I have some other handouts for the, the midterm. 
as well. And um, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Um, I hope this was more useful than uh, just breaking it up into an hour. I don't like talking too much because that's my that's that's my habit. But uh, I think this is this is worthwhile. Okay. Thanks a lot, and uh, we'll post this on online. Thank you very much.